the ass. How I does north, say east, south, west, east, and west on the prime work region. on batter? I said on the zero longitude. I said or we get. But we don't think that you understand how directions work. So when you're trying to tell us where things are using directions, right, it's a problem. So yeah, to, maybe it'll help you. But they they believe that you can't cross Antarctica. So absolutely, you cannot go north to south. Because can have, have you looked at any of the visuals that we're putting up? They're all for you, man. We got two in the visual up here. We got two in the jumbotron. Right? There's one about just directions to the database. There's one with a nice little, a nice little animation of Weiss. Now that, that, this is confusing, right? Because he uses a ruler to show you that you have to keep correcting to the center. But if you use a ruler to maintain directionality and you don't correct towards the center, you're using an azimuthal direction preserving wrong, right? You're, that's retarded. That's not. You're no longer following any directionality. All right, so always correcting towards the center is the only way to maintain directionality. Otherwise, it wouldn't be towards the middle, towards the North Pole, right? Can I be heard? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, the other thing is I wanted to add that we don't know that Antarctica, quote unquote Antarctica, is surrounding us 360 degrees. It could be still ice surrounding us, right? But they could have a little small island that they call Antarctica. So we have to be careful because they could just be like holding out on this little like area that they're calling Antarctica at the bottom there or at, on, the out, on the outskirts. And then and then they'll say, OK, now we've we've totally gone over the middle of this area. Now flat Earth is debunked. And that is not <laughs> debunked. Flat Earth. We've already the globe is impossible, you know, and, and there's ways to show that. Right. So we we're not on a spinning ball. We can show that to you that that's not the thing. So and. Then that brings us back to, then we're on a we're on a stationary level Earth because that's all we experience. It's not a belief. It's not like the narrative is right. It's all someone else proves it, you know, proves something else that's better or another map or something. We already know it's not a spinning ball. It can't be. So that's over. Okay. I want to say that. Yeah, so what he's saying, we're still looking for that exclusive evidence <laughs> for globular Earth reality or some type of orbital motion, something like that. So, yeah, it seems like it's safe to say that the Earth is not in motion and there's no curvature. Um, however, before we get into that, though, uh, well, first, let me just make sure, Carl, did you, did you uh, check the jumbo for some of these demonstrations? I actually DM'd you. Shout out my boy TM pulled up. What up, TM? Um, I DM'd you. Uh, yes. from him. Good to see you, bro. Um, I sent you a DM from him so you could see how directions work. And Shane already hit you with a bunch of things up in the jumbo. And guys, just uh, uh, if you want to, just save the post. Uh, take a look at it while we're talking about it. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the mentions. I'm checking the replies. Or come grab a mic and you can talk to the guys directly. Dude, I didn't have those from TM. Excellent adding them. Thank you. Snags. <laughs> Ain't didn't have something. What? Bro, y'all well, just you're welcome, Shane. <laughs> hey, I was like, I don't have either one of these. Dude, nice. Speaking of Shane, the, the presentation you did this last one, I think it was Tuesday. Drop that for everybody because that, that really lays it out uh, as far as how that goes. Yeah, they Taking inverse engineered. Yeah. yeah, the Aristotle's and, and, and yeah, all of Shane's stuff is Shane. He's got a whole flat Earth model, flat Earth database, and the flat Earth model and everything else. So, if you have any uh, questions on how it could be, you know, exchanged for what we think we know already? Well, it's just the same, you know, map. It's just they just use a transform to make it a globe. That's how they did it. Um. Yeah. Speaking about that. Uh. So, face face the truth. Uh, you've been a great sport uh, this evening. Are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, cool. Um, do you do you have any questions for anybody on mic? Uh, I I guess like I, you guys have heard this question before, but uh, when the, I can't remember his name, start with a P, Pius. Uh, he mentioned how it would be possible to get accurate measurements on land uh, with technology nowadays. So I'm just curious why we don't have a more accurate map of the world. Like you guys understand that the uh, the flat earth map, quote unquote, is not very accurate when it comes to the southern hemisphere. Saying. 
Well, no, right? It's exactly the same accurate as the globe and the other equal 201 projections of the same geographic coordinate system that is the curve, you know, as you look, like to know it, longitude, latitude, radicule. Okay. So when you're saying it looks funny to you, you're not taking into account the equidistant distant potential and the absolute projection type of that projection to put this continent in the way to make sure the longitudinal spacing is equidistant all the way through, right? So it's the same distance. Yeah, but what I'm saying is if you measure each of the continents and then put them on a flat map, there shouldn't be any distortion to any of those measurements. Is that correct? No, no, I think correct. They're the exact same size as on the globe, right? They're displayed differently in a visual scaling method that is longitudinally convex, right? So from the center, radially extending outward, distortion visually increases. But data like like looking at it, representing all the same data. So therefore, same distances, same sizes. All right, I'm not sure I understand what you're getting at there. So there's a fake globe, and then there's a fake globe flattened out map. There's no flat earth map. Does that help? Okay, and that is clear. my my question is like, why isn't there a flat earth map if we're living on a flat plane? If you take pictures from a set height, you should be able to stitch together a perfect map with no distortion. Well, so the whole, the whole earth is like water, right? So no one knows how to get distance over water. And what they've done historically is just take cosmography, which they had from before, which is mapping the stars and getting the traditional skeleton infrastructure for longitude, latitude. They call it spherical coordinate system, which is angles to the stars. You have an alt as system, which is when you're taking like say an alt or an azimuth that is for anyone anywhere. That is by its definition, a spherical coordinate system because you have a bisecting meridian right in the middle, which is the basic first requirement for any spherical coordinate system. System and goes the same for celestial for the for the celestial coordinates of right ascension declination for the geographic for you know longitude latitude and for any of the other projections of which you're allowed to have a map anything that you know is a map is projecting an inherently spherical gratitude okay and why do what why can't there be a new way of doing things that we don't well if require I, that right so i mean if everything's based on the stars then it's based on a hemispherical view and this this spherical view is we enforcing us to inflict sphericity on it then we would need a flat plane of stars to similarly map out this the plane of stars above us to get the flat map otherwise oh. all maps will continuously match the stars as they have since the very first map in antiquity that doesn't make sense at all to me we have tools to measure the ground without looking up at all so North America can be measured. Is that not something that you can agree with? Well, that's cool. But do you know how the, you know how they measure the circumference of the Earth? In which model? Well, in reality, in history, and according to Wikipedia and Google, have they measured the circumference? Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, they well here. I'll go through the steps. It's about one through first. They stare directly at the sun, and then that's all the steps. That's done. Oh, they measured the Earth. What they did was take a shadow angle, right? They used a fake Greek called Eratosthenes, and they measured oh, okay. a distance, yeah. a known distance, yeah. right? Yeah. Looking at Sorry. the shadow, yeah, they said it was 7.2 yeah. degrees between Serene and Alexandria. They divided that by 360, multiplied it by 800 kilometers to get roughly 40,000 kilometers before the transfer to get the geodesic distance, right? Because when they put it in a spherical order, then they get the actual geodesic distance, which would comport with the current geographic radicule and that wonderful 24,901 figure that everyone knows and loves. And then dividing that back into it, you get the actual distance which okay. is what they have for the circumference I today. Guess. But that's what they did by measuring the sun. All they did was measure the limit of the sun. If you plot Alexandria in a radius of 3959 on the Gleason's map, which again, the flattened out globe, it's just a circle around Alexandria denoting the rising sun and the limits of, of the sun. Can we so. stop talking about globes and how they do things in the past? I, I, I don't understand why we can't do it a new way where we just measure the ground without looking up and using tools that we have available today without We're without with every, every flat earth is with you bro oh why isn't there a plan to do so well every time we try to measure the ground people try to look up the sky it's the weirdest thing what do, what do you mean every time you try to measure the ground well all of your measurements of sphericity come from the sky in case you didn't know that or plane surveying yeah <laughs> which none of them come from the ground and when they come from the ground there's this thing called optical curvature which is really what it's based on when you come back from you know angular resolution limits in the properly attributed Rayleigh's criterion for when you would see things and counting for bottom up obstruction on, on a flat plane you get exactly that right so okay and do we have a flat earth number for the circumference of the flat earth do you want to know the circumference of my spherical vision limit of your uh, no, like of a flat Earth map. Of a flat Earth map. Yeah. 
I think that would be uh, that would require us having free explorative access to an article. Okay, so let's say, um, like, what's the conference exactly. up to the 60th parallel then? You know, that is something that uh, that we should try to do. Because I, I think that may be somewhat definitive, but again, how will we measure distances over water? Mm. So they're measuring it by the stars again, right? Because the whole thing is over water, especially out at the 60th parallel. So they're going to compare an angle measurement to a star based on the spherical coordinate system to a corresponding angle measurement to a spar from a spherical coordinate. So you don't think there's any other way of measuring distance other than looking up? Over water? Yep. I mean, name a couple. You got... Yeah, Go I posed a question earlier. How do we measure distance over water? Uh, without referencing any coordinates. Well, I mean, if you fly an aircraft at a set speed with instruments that determine that you're going in a straight line. Ah, now, now we're getting somewhere. So all planes require GPS. Um, I'm not a pilot, so maybe there is some other way to determine distances without... GPS and the coordinate system. Um, do you know any uh, of any base? Uh, I don't know of any that we currently use, but I'm saying that you could come up with a system to make sure that uh, you're not relying on GPS. Yeah, the GPS would say you're on this course, but you could come up with a system to make sure that you are not deviating from a straight line. That's what we're asking. How? Okay, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Right. So this is what we've been thinking about for a minute. Like, you know, how do we actually do that? And okay. even if we're appealing to, and this is why I want to talk to, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Orbital that popped in here when I said he was hiding my comments. You know, one of his main arguments is about flights. And we got a new perspective up here. He really don't want to smoke about flights when it comes to new perspective. But he, he dipped out of here uh, at the perfect time. But, you know, we always have this conversation about the difference between airspeed and ground speed. You know, what speeds are we given? What speeds, speeds are they claiming? And are they accounting for the current that they're in? Or are they just measuring speed relative to that current? Because if we're not given the ground speed, we really don't know the true velocity of the plane itself. Um, therefore, they, it's easier to cook distances and, and fluctuate times and all these different type of things because we don't have the actual speed relative to the ground. We have the speed relative to the current that they're in, which is called airspeed. Yeah. That's um, a problem. Speaking of which, speaking of which, uh, to mention uh, Labatt, the uh, model builder, um, one of the things that, you know, I, that he did was he, he downloaded, I think it was like 2 million flights over two weeks or something like that. He downloaded all the pings, right? Then he plotted out the pings on the AE map, right? And he, show, he was showing that they were reporting a three hour discrepancy in what they reported as um, compared to what the pings were showing him. There wasn't any difference in what he, he got for the north, but he said in the south, they're only using like just a few different airlines, you know, so it's exclusive. Like there's only a few different planes that actually do that route. And what he was showing from his pings, there was a three hour discrepancy in what they were actually reporting to what it looked like they were actually doing. It's anecdotal because you have to believe that that's what he's doing, but he wasn't trying to like, like, you know, skew the information he was just telling us about it and showed his mapping of it and that's huge you know because if that's true then that would that would answer a lot of things right about the south yeah but you you understand why there's fewer uh flights in the south like logically right it's not like, about fewer it's not about the fewer it's about that they reported a different time that it took than it actually took Okay, I'd be interested to know in those flights. Yeah, you know, that would be something that, that so let's just say that is true, and that would answer a lot of it. Yep. The other test, uh, he mentioned me about airplanes. You can, I could, I could walk you through it, how you were asking about a test that you could do. Yeah. Well, so if, you, if you've flown in an airplane, right, and you've landed safely, then that's a test you can do. <laughs> and I can explain that. Um, See, there's a there's a, a tangential velocity gradient, right? Because of the equator supposedly being faster at a thousand miles an hour, right? And it tapers up to zero. 
right? Now, all pilots treat the Earth as stationary and level. Do you know that? Do you know that? Yes, I've seen the documents. All right, so and that's not really arguable. It's not, it's not like a, it's not a conspiracy. They're, they just say it's the same exact thing. Like a global will say, you wouldn't train the pilot any differently to fly over a stationary leveler as opposed to a spinning baller. Is that raising any red flags just on the surface for you? Uh, well, there, there wouldn't be any difference. Uh, not when it comes to like, like flying a drone on on an airplane, for example. Like you're in a closed system, right? Like it doesn't matter that the the airplane that you're on is going 500 miles an hour. The drone would still hover in the middle of the aircraft. We conserve momentum, right? Yeah. Right. So, you, but you only get that from being on the ground. Right, because if it takes off at a 500 mile per hour latitude, goes up in the air, well, it's already spinning with the Earth because it was on the ground with the Earth. Yeah, right? so not it's, because it's... the air, not because the air is moving it, but because it conserved the momentum from being on the Earth, right? Yeah, like the it only mm -hmm. accelerated by 500 miles an hour. It doesn't matter how fast it was going initially. Yeah, yeah, so it could it could turn around hypothetically, and then land on this, uh, the landing strip that it took off from. And if it's still conserving that momentum of exactly 500 miles an hour, then it's okay. But it had to be in perfect sync, right? Because a little bit of difference between the ground and the, air, and the airplane's eastward tangential velocity would cause a problem, right? If it wasn't in sync, it has to be moving in perfect unison eastward, right, with the Earth for it to treat the Earth as stationary. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't, I don't know what you mean by perfect sync. Well, if it's move, if the, if they say that Earth, Earth is rotating eastward, mm -hmm. right, then the plane has to be rotating in perfect unison with that eastward rotation, so that it can just treat the Earth as stationary. If it, if the Earth were, were spinning faster eastward than the plane is, right, like say it's landing in a, you know, facing north or facing south, but it's landing and it's not moving along with the Earth then the wheels will break off or they'll be, you know, it, it would just die because the, the, the runway it's trying to land on would be moving perpendicular to the direction it's trying to land. You get that concept? I think I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the earth doesn't stop rotating to allow the plane to just land on it, land on it. Like it's stationary. Yeah. The, earth, the plane has to be moving in perfect one-to-one -one sync with the eastward rotation. Right. Okay. Now but conserve, you conserve momentum, conserve momentum. Well, we can just say that, right? 500 miles an hour. And it's in perfect sync, right? So we'll just say that conceptually for now, right? The problem is there's a gradient of tangential velocities, right? So if that plane flies to the south, where he's going to land on a runway that's on the equator, and that city's moving at 1,000 miles an hour, but he only has the conserved momentum of 500 miles an hour, where does he get the extra 500? Acceler it has to accelerate twice as fast sideways by the time it gets there without the pilot knowing anything about it or caring about it. Just going to land on the earth like a stationary when it gets there, which means the plane has to be moving in perfect unison now with a 1,000 mile an hour eastward tangential velocity. Uh, I, I think the best way to describe the situation is if like, you had a drone on a 747 that had been emptied so you have lots of room to fly a drone around the plane is flying mm -hmm. at 500 miles an hour you lift the drone off mm -hmm. it just hovers there you can go mm -hmm. forward and back you could have a little runway on on the plane it doesn't matter mm -hmm. which direction the drone goes it will always be able to land and it as long as the velocity of the plane doesn't change then it would oh just... yeah but what if but is part of that plane moving at a thousand miles an hour and part of that plane moving at 500 miles an hour Well, no. No, so it's not the same. Okay, but those, like, the distances that it's going 500 miles an hour versus 1,000 miles an hour is how far apart? It doesn't matter, but let's say it's like, you know, 1,000 miles, 7,000 miles, 8,000, doesn't really matter. How do you, what's the mechanism that accelerates the plane twice as fast sideways, so it'll be in perfect sync with a thousand miles an hour rotation. What does that? What's the force? What's the dynamic force? 
Now, we can have a kinematic concept where there's a rule that we're just going to say it's in sync and subtract the amount that it would need to accelerate and just say it's automatically in sync. Or just think of it as 15 degrees rather than miles per hour. But that's not the, the actuality of the situation. The actual physical relationship of the air acting on the plane to accelerate it twice as fast sideways is what you're trying to figure out. Now, air moving the plane or pushing the plane or accelerating the plane in any way is wind, right? But we already know winds go in all directions. You could, like, it doesn't matter how long that flight is, it could be eight hours. What if that, throughout that eight hours, right, we have a, a, a strong westward wind the whole time, right? So if you're going to say the air is going to move the plane twice as fast sideways and the wind's going the opposite direction, how does that work? That's a good question. It doesn't work. This is this debunks the globe emphatically. It's a test that we can we can do every day. It's done every day. It's done every second of the day. Planes land safely. I could even argue at the 500 mile per hour mark, even if he took off and went up in the air and turned it right around, he wouldn't be in perfect sync because it's in a separate reference frame. You can't say it's in, in two reference frames and one reference frame at the same time. That's the contradiction that the globe overlooks and they run away from this argument every chance they get because this debunked it in 2015. There's nothing new. It's just that I've come up with a way of wording it so that it's very clear that it cannot work for planes to fly to a different tangential velocity without the right conserved momentum. And even, you know what, it gets even worse. Even if it could accelerate and the pilot were totally aware of it and it had jets on the side of the plane to continue moving it, right, or with the earth, well, then it's got to continue moving with the earth as it's slowing to a land in a perpendicular oh, direction. Wait, there's more. Yeah. So even if it were to catch up and be going a thousand miles an hour, the earth doesn't stop for it to land. It's got to be moving sideways in perfect sync. There's no way around that. And it could be at any angle. All these runways are not at all designed to accommodate a moving earth and a plane landing on it, right? The only way it would work is like if there was east, only east and west facing runways, and they were either like slamming on their brakes or speeding up so that they can catch up to the earth that's spinning out from under them. The earth spinning with planes debunks the globe emphatically. Because it could be any angle. The calculations would just be, you wouldn't even think to do those kind of calculations. Like I'm coming in at south, southwest at 39, blah, blah, blah. And now I've got to be, I've got to make sure the plane's going backwards and sideways with the rotation as I'm trying to come to a stop in a completely random direction. Think about it. You could have, you could go loop to loop. You, you could miss the runway and have to loop around. So now all of a sudden is the air moving your plane, it, is the extra amount calculating it so it's in perfect sync with the earth somehow? Again, because, I mean, it doesn't work, bro. The earth rotating with a plane in the separate reference frame, which it is, right? It would be. The only way for the earth, to, for the pilot to treat the earth as stationary and level is because it's stationary and level. The dynamics for a spinning ball would be completely different. And it's ludicrous that we can just confidently say, oh, yeah, it would be just exactly the same. It wouldn't matter if it's spinning in a, in a ball. It would be just the same for a pilot as flying over a stationary level or like we know they're all trained in all flight simulators provide for that environment. Well, like, I, I guess like another way of putting it, like if, if you think that, like, does that mean that if you, you think a helicopter takes off and goes straight up that the earth would just rotate under it? So if you took a helicopter- No, I'll let you peg the question all day long with the 500 mile per hour, you know, conserve momentum. If you want to have that, it wouldn't last forever, but you know, yeah, conserve momentum is a thing, right? But they take, just like they do with everything else, like the idea that you could be flying on a plane at 500 miles an hour and you don't really feel it, right? So yeah. then therefore you could be going 1,000 miles an hour in one direction, 67,000 miles an hour in another direction around the sun. And the sun could be going 500 miles per hour, 500,000 miles per hour, half a million miles per hour in another direction because we can just take all those mass, right? And combine all those mass and call it one motion, right? Through vector mass, right? That doesn't mean it's one motion. And it doesn't mean that one linear direction is comparable to that. So they take one small example of something we know to be true, which is conserved momentum is a thing, 
you can pop that ping pong ball up in the air as it's going on the train. It's going to go right back to where it started because it has mm -hmm. that conserved momentum, right? But that doesn't mean that it, that ping pong ball can all of a sudden be, you know, at a thousand miles an hour when it only had 500 miles per hour and land perfectly fine on that surface too, just because we call it one system and we say the air is going to be there. And so the air is going to do it somehow magically, even though the air as winds could be blowing in whatever direction. It doesn't work. Well, hey, let me ask you a question, perspective, new perspective. Sure. Let's say, let's say you uh, launched a boat um, off the coast of Ecuador and right. traveled west. As cl and, you know, uh, and your starting point was as close as to the prime meridian at zero latitude as possible. And you were to travel around the globe, per se. Land on land at the port as close to zero latitude as possible. Travel through the land, get on another boat, keep going. Theoretically, if you were to end at the same point that you started at, would that would that prove whether or not that you actually went around some kind of circular object? Oh, it, it, that's just, it, dude, it's just if, what you're talking about. Because, I heard you mention this earlier. Well, it's I know, just a but, circle. But, but then, a circle doesn't mean a sphere. But, but sacred sent me something that just basically seems like if even if you're doing that, you're just basically going to be going through a whirlpool, it looked like. You know, you're kind of going in a circle. Instead of going, in, like, well, traveling in, on a flat plane whirlpool, there's north to south in so many directions that so no it, it, north like, <laughs> just all you need is north right all yeah. all planes they just they just navigate according to north which is in the center but if you just so use the, the compass that thing. was given to us by the people that we don't trust and you just try to travel on one no one a compass is a compass it's not about the people that we don't trust compass <laughs> points north that's what they use they're going around in a circle doesn't mean it's a ball bro. no but we're not going to be traveling north we're going to be traveling across the equator the prime meridian 